what if, what if you could decide at the end of your life exactly when and where your death would happen? Maybe, instead of dying alone in the middle of the night in a hospital bed, you could be at home at a time of your own choosing. You could decide who would be with you, holding your hand or even embracing you as you left this life. And what if a doctor could help ensure that your death was comfortable, peaceful, even dignified? You might never look at dying the same way again. A hundred years ago, most people in North America died at home. Modern medicine has saved and extended countless lives, but it also took the majority of deaths out of our homes and into our hospitals, so we've become removed and unfamiliar with death and dying. Our current medical model likes to frame death as an enemy rather than a natural stage in life. So some of you may have memories of loved ones who are dying that are less than ideal, maybe in an acute care hospital, perhaps attached to machines that were monitoring irreversible decline or receiving treatments that could no longer stop their illness. Some might even have been begging for your help to end their suffering. Palliative care is an approach that optimizes quality of life over quantity of life. But every clinician knows there are times when no approach will adequately relieve a person's suffering. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about assisted dying, the legalized, compassionate end-of-life care provided by clinicians who safely and effectively end a person's life in specifically safeguarded circumstances which include the explicit request of a competent adult. Assisted dying. Now, right about now, there's a few thousand people, myself included, who are fairly flabbergasted that I'm standing here and talking to you about this topic today. Not the least of which is because for 22 years, I was a maternity doctor delivering life into this world. Then, in 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down the prohibition of assisted dying and our government legislated this new field of health care. And I became one of the first physicians in the country to offer assisted dying to people who met all of the required criteria. How has this played out in my life? Well, my husband likes to joke he now sleeps with one eye open. <laughs> but seriously, I have met the most extraordinary people. I knew from the first moment I met him that Ed was an eccentric man, 68 years old, and he was proud to say he had never held a job and had lived the life of a free spirit. <laughs> like over 65% of the people I work with, Ed had a cancer that had progressed to the point that he would be dying soon. It was impossible for him to even venture outside, and life confined within four walls was simply not a life for Ed. When I arrived on the day of his scheduled death, we chatted for a while first, and after a few minutes, he excused himself to go to the restroom. I was shocked when two minutes later, he returned wearing a full clown suit. <laughs> Tie-dyed pants, a t-shirt, a colorful clown wig, and a red nose. Despite all our previous interactions, I'd never realized Ed was an amateur clown. I asked him why he'd chosen to wear the clown suit on that day, and he told me he wanted to go out laughing. Are you sure you're ready? Oh yes, I am certainly ready. He was lying there, all colorfully laid out and staring straight up at the ceiling. Not nervous, not sad but not smiling. I was standing to his left, close to the bed, with my medications laid out beside me on the bedside table. And often at this time, as I begin giving the medicine, I'll guide my patients to a cherished memory. But on that day, I leaned over instead and asked, Ed, why don't cannibals ever eat clowns? <laughs> well, he turned his face towards mine with a really big smile, and he answered, because they always taste a little funny. And we were nose to nose, and both of us grinning from ear to ear. And I heard him chuckle as he turned his head back to a comfortable position. And then he closed his eyes, 
and fell asleep. And some moments really stick with you. Ed's story really encompasses so much of what I want people to understand about assisted dying, that it's an individual's choice, that what's most meaningful to the person is what becomes most important, that levity and humor can be acceptable, and that an assisted death in ways big or small almost always reflects a person's life and how they chose to live it. You might be surprised to discover assisted dying isn't new. When I began this work in 2016, there were already six countries outside of Canada where some form of assisted dying was permitted, and five states within the US. Today, there are 14 countries where assisted dying is legal, and 11 regions within the US alone. Why do you think there's been so much recent change? I want to tell you about Harvey. By the time I met him, Harvey was 74 years old and dying of end-stage liver failure. I met with Harvey and his wife at his home on several occasions. There is, of course, a rigorous process to be followed, a number of eligibility criteria to be met, and procedural safeguards to be satisfied. You can't just call up and ask for an assisted death. Harvey was terminally ill but still very capable of speaking for himself. And within a matter of days, I was able to confirm that he was eligible for an assisted death. And then something remarkable happened. Harvey immediately stopped worrying about how he would die and spend the rest of his days focused on how he wanted to live. Harvey planned and attended a weekend open house in his home for neighbors and friends to come say goodbye. He snuck a final sip of beer, <laughs> and eventually we choreographed his death together. He told me who he wanted to be there and where he wanted to be, in his own bed, in his own home, and I quickly came to understand that Harvey wanted to die just as he had lived, self-made and in control. When I arrived at Harvey's home on the day of his death, we first spoke privately so I could confirm he hadn't changed his mind and to get his final consent. And then I prepared his family for what they could expect. When we finally gathered together in his bedroom, there was only Harvey on his bed, his two grown children close by, both of them holding him or touching him in some way, and his wife sitting on a chair to his right, pulled up close and leaning in. I was holding his left arm, ready to administer the medications, and Harvey was planning to die exactly as he had planned, being held by his family and gazing into the eyes of his wife. His wife of 52 years. Can you imagine? They connected there, forehead to forehead, whispering to each other as I began giving the medicine. She held his face in her hands and stroked his head and told him it was okay that she loved him, that she would miss him, but that she'd be all right. She whispered inaudible words, and I saw him smile. And the intimacy of that moment was so absorbing. I'll admit I struggled to focus on what I was doing. She told him to let go and that she was there for him. And as was true on most nights of his life, hers were the last words he heard as he fell asleep. Another one of those images etched in my mind forever. Like I said, some things really stick with you. It's not always easy to explain my work. Can you imagine me at a cocktail party? <laughs> Someone inevitably asks, so what do you do? I think the honest answer is I help people. Death and dying are an inevitable part of life, but we've been removed from much of the process. Most of us are poorly informed about what we might expect and often fearful of even asking to talk about it. But I urge you to take a closer look because assisted dying is humane, compassionate care. It will certainly change the way we consider our options at the end of life, but take a closer look and you'll discover something more that assisted dying is less about death than it is about how we wish to live. Thank you. <laughs>